Boss fights are often the highlight of any game. Arriving at pivotal moments, they provide players with a chance to test their skills, and if all goes to plan, a chance to gain some closure on events that have been transpiring. But sometimes these encounters also serve as extremely poignant narrative beats that go beyond simply advancing the main scenario. From dramatic deaths to adding context to the surrounding events, some boss fights would bring real emotional baggage to the table, creating a lasting impact that will be felt long after the credits rolled. Final Fantasy would excel in this area, with numerous bosses that punched players right in the gut, and others that became heart-wrenching when additional context was layered over the top. And it's precisely those boss fights that we're going to talk about today. The fights where, once realising what was going on and grasping the gravity of the situation, the player felt like it was their emotional state that would need a phoenix down. As usual, we'll be featuring one boss fight per game, and as a disclaimer, we have chosen to omit a certain boss from Final Fantasy XIV from this video due to the impact, recency, and potential for the accidental ruining of a pretty important story arc. So with that, here's 7 tragic boss fights that hit you right in the feels. And to get things started, we're going to jump into everyone's favourite blitzball playing absentee father turned world destroying monster, Ject. Throughout Final Fantasy X, Titus made the disdain he had for his father extremely clear. Like Titus, Ject had been a star blitzball player, but he struggled with fame, turning to alcoholism. An unfortunate consequence was that Ject was a neglectful father, and when he was present, would be unnecessarily harsh. This led to a lot of resentment, something that was amplified after Ject disappeared. After winding up in Spira, Ject then joined with a summoner named Braska and a former warrior monk named Orin. And after helping Braska complete his pilgrimage, Ject would become the final Aeon, and subsequently the new Sin, a fact unknown to both Tidus and the player until the story was well underway. As Sin, Ject proceeded to draw Tidus to himself as he sought his own destruction, and only trusted Tidus to fulfil this task. This would culminate in the penultimate boss fight of the game, and while it could be challenging, it was the wider context that made it all the more memorable. Shortly before the fight, Ject warns Tidus that once the battle began, he wouldn't be himself anymore, and both men knew that Tidus killing Ject was the only path forward for either of them. What made this boss fight so tragic was the fact that while the player mainly saw Tidus' side of the story for the majority of the game, the repentant and reborn version of Ject was also slowly revealed through spheres that were scattered throughout Spira. By the time the two fought, however, Ject could never apologise for the things he had done, and Titus could never forgive him. But even though Titus still hated Ject, he did not want to lose his father for a second time, an outcome that was unfortunately unavoidable. Embracing after the battle as Ject died, Titus told Ject that he was glad to have him as a father, and in the final cutscene, the player would see the two as Pyrefly spirits, finally at peace. Galuf was a mainstay in the player's party from the outset of Final Fantasy V, but he suffered from amnesia for a large portion of the story. As the scenario progressed, Galuf's condition would improve upon reuniting with his granddaughter, with his memories propelling the party forward. And this was because Galuf was in actuality one of the original Dawn Warriors, who sealed X-Death away years before the event seen within Final Fantasy V occurred. Sensing X-Death's return, Galuf travelled to Bart's world to halt his reawakening, but ultimately his plan failed, and this led to a fateful confrontation within the Great Forest of Moor. Inside the Guardian Tree, the party mistook the seals protecting the crystals for monsters, defeating them and inadvertently handing the crystals over to X-Death. Subsequently rendered helpless by the fiend's magic, the party seemed to be all but defeated when Krill suddenly appeared. Ever the sadist, X-Death focused his assault on Krill, something that gave Galath the strength of will to break free and attack X-Death head on while the rest of the party watched unable to act. What followed was a battle that had no fail state, as Galath weathered attack after attack from X-Death until the warlock was shaken at his foe's resolve and made a hasty exit. Following the battle, Galath was utterly spent. Bart's, Lena, and Faris all tried various powerful curative spells and items in an attempt to revive their fallen comrade, but there was nothing they could do. 
the sage-like character sacrificing themselves for the party had been an archetype in Final Fantasy games prior to V, but the fates of the characters like Minwu and Tella were usually telegraphed ahead of time. By contrast, Galaf's death came as a complete surprise, and it was made all the more poignant as Galaf ended up passing his abilities onto Krill. Few characters' motivations in Final Fantasy have been as confusing, either unintentionally or not, as Ravis Nox Florey. In Final Fantasy XV, Ravis appeared as a one-dimensional character. He appeared sporadically and inconsistently as the head of the Niflheim Imperial Army, leading the Empire's god-slaying operations. This was a rather paradoxical position for Ravis to hold, as in his youth, he was the victim of the Empire's attack on Tenebrae, which saw his mother killed before his very eyes. But that in itself detailed the problem, the majority of Ravis's backstory could only be found through the Final Fantasy XV universe. It was in this attack, which was shown towards the start of Kingsglaive, that Ravis witnessed King Regis abandon Tenebrae for the sake of Noctis' safety, an event that caused him to harbour deep hatred for the Lucian royal family. This hatred eventually led him to seek the Ring of the Luciae for himself, which in turn rejected him, causing him great physical harm, leading to further resentment. Ultimately though, Ravis would set his goal of revenge aside for the one thing left in the world he still cared about, his sister Luna Freya, and Ravis remained committed to this even though he did not agree with her decision to support Noctis. This love would end up driving all of Ravis' decisions to a fault, and after the events that transpired in Altissia, Ravis would be sentenced to death for helping his sister. It was in Niflheim, post-execution, that Noctis encountered a twisted and star-scourged corrupted Ravis. Begging for Noctis to end it, it's hard to say the battle against Ravis was a memorable one, as the Ravis we knew was already long gone. Dying alone, his sister dead, and with his desire to do the right thing horribly mutilated, Ravis' story was compelling and incredibly depressing. It was just such a shame that so much extra work would be required on the part of the player to piece everything together and make the story one that actually had some meaning. Bereft of any positive role models outside of the movies, Cypher Ormacy would grow up to be a misguided and occasionally cruel young man. After joining Balam Garden, Cypher would continue to act out, spurning his talent to earn a reputation of being a troublemaker. This would then be witnessed firsthand as Cypher's brash leadership style led him to not graduate alongside his peers. Lacking a clear path, Cypher decided to follow his dream, becoming a knight for the sorceress Adia, something that would lead to numerous clashes against Squall. But by the time the player squared off against Cypher inside the lunatic Pandora, they found him dishevelled, manic and desperate. A thrall for the sorceress Ultimacia, who had even been disowned by his own friends. Those traits were in full display during the encounter, but after being defeated, Cypher was faced with a grim reality. Even though he knew his actions were heinous, he had nowhere to run, and no one he could turn to. This desperation led to Cypher sinking to a new low, as he took advantage of a quiet moment to take Renoa hostage and bring her to Sorceress Adele, fulfilling Ultimacia's desire. In the end, Cypher's whole existence was a cry for help, but, seeing his complete and utter resignation after the brutal defeat at the hands of a lifelong rival only served to drive this fact home. As a happy-go-lucky flirt, Edge was always good for a laugh or two. In juxtaposition to his characterization, however, the story of his parents, the King and Queen of Eblen, and how Edge joined the party was one steeped in despair. The King and Queen of Eblan were beloved rulers to their people, but their kingdom was attacked by the archfiend Rubicante, and when Cecil and the party arrived, they found it in ruins. While the populace was in part able to flee to the nearby cave of Eblan, the king and queen were unfortunately abducted in the attack, leading Edge, their son, to mount a counter-offensive against Rubicante out of revenge. After joining Cecil's party and entering the Tower of Babel, Edge was able to reunite with his parents, but by that time, it was too late. The King and Queen of Eblan appeared to him as monsters, twisted by the devilish Dr. Luguay. In the ensuing fight, all the player had to do to emerge victorious was defend, but that didn't make completing it any easier from an emotional standpoint. This was because, as the battle went on, Edge's parents became lucid, 
and once coming to terms with the fact that there was no way for them to return to their former selves, gave Edge one final word of encouragement and farewell before self-destructing before his eyes. Edge's pleas for his parents to not leave him made this moment hit hard, but the following dialogue with Rubicante made the moment hit even harder, as even the Archfiend wanted to distance himself from the depraved acts of Dr. Legay. Despite his insistence that he was not responsible for their transformations, Rubicante was then engaged by an edge racked with pain over the loss of his parents, allowing both him and the player to enact their revenge and bring the Archfiend down for what he did to the kingdom of Eblan. Final Fantasy VII had a lot of both of its main scenario and side stories revolve around the topic of death. Moments like the destruction of the Sector VII support pillar or the death of Aerith were hard to forget. But when it came to tragic boss fights, the story of Dine definitely stood out long after the credits rolled. Encountered in the Coral Desert prison, Dine was more than just a ghost from Barrett's past with a matching machine gun arm and a grudge. He was Barrett's former best friend and the biological father of Barrett's daughter, Marlene. Prior to the events of the game, Dine and Barrett lived together with their families in the mining town of Coral. The two unfortunately had a falling out over the construction of a macro reactor nearby, but this would prove to be the least of their troubles, as after the subsequent sabotage of said reactor, Shinra ruthlessly raised their hometown in retaliation. Both men ended up losing their wives in the ensuing chaos as well as an arm, and Barrett believed Dine to be dead, having seen him fall into a chasm at the hands of Shinra Scarlet. This left Barrett alone to care for Marlene, Dine's daughter. When Cloud's party reached the Gold Saucer, they were, unbeknownst to them at the time, mistaken for Dine as the perpetrators of multiple homicides, sent to the Coral Prison as punishment. Their efforts to clear their name and escape then led to them coming face to face with Dine, the real perpetrator. While Barrett was undoubtedly happy to see his old friend alive, circumstances unfortunately turned dark. The player found that while Dime was glad to find out that Marlene was alive and well, grief had twisted his mind, and it was because of this that he wanted to kill Marlene so that she could be reunited with her mother. What followed was a one-on-one -on -one battle between Dine and Barrett that was more cinematic than anything, with both men exchanging blows until one of them fell. Following his defeat, Dine declared that his hands were too stained with blood to hold his daughter anymore and proceeded to jump from a cliff to his demise. Dine and his connection to Barrett really fleshed out the latter's backstory and added some real depth to his character. It's a little odd that Square decided to insert this sad and very human story of grief in between a casino adventure and some mandatory chocobo racing, but if anything, that only served to make it stick out as one of the more dark boss fights Final Fantasy VII had to offer. For our final entry, I think it's fair to say there's no better fit than the final stand of Zack Fair. As a finale to a Final Fantasy game, this battle stood out for many reasons. For one, it wasn't a showdown with a big bad, but a struggle to survive as long as possible. It also incorporated gameplay mechanics in a way that had never been seen before, and perhaps the most intriguing reason was that those who had played the original game already knew the fate of Zack Fair, and being forced to play through his final moments was rather heartbreaking, especially as it also kind of felt like you could defy fate by playing well. But unfortunately, no matter how well you played, the fight was unwinnable. What truly made it memorable was the DMW system. Throughout the game, players got to learn more about Zack's life and the friendships he had built, and during the final encounter, the DMW system would place scattered memories from his friends, each one disappearing from his mind as he failed to trigger their limit break abilities. A sign of his fatigue from fighting and running, this was an extremely potent reminder of his situation and really drove home the tragedy of the event. The final face to remain in Zack's DMW at the end of the fight was Aerith's, a testament to his feelings for her. As Zack lay in the mud, rain coming down, a single Shinra soldier walked over to deliver the final blow while memories of Aerith played, eventually also disappearing. Zack's legacy, as we all know, would live on through Cloud, and with his last ounce of strength, he bequeathed Angeal's Buster Sword to Cloud. The game then ended with Zack asking the player if he became a hero, and if you could make out what he was saying over the sound of your own sobbing, we think you'd tell him that he did. 
And with that, I think we'll end it there. As I don't know about you, but I'm not too sure how much more my heart can take. Those were seven tragic boss fights that hit you right in the feels. We know there's probably a few we didn't include, so be sure to let us know in the comments below which boss fights you found to be the most tragic. And if you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and be sure to subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, Chris M. Walker, The Livestream, Elsa Claire Farron, Galcian D. Kujata, Gregory, Justin Dent, Lord of Mourning, and Zukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.